I think the, the previous discussion fits very nicely with, uh, with, uh, with my talk because what I'm going to try to uh, talk about is how we can move or augment existing systems with this new approach uh, based on open EHR. So uh, my name is Tomas Gornik. I'm the CEO of uh, Better, a company that was uh, uh, demerged from Marant just recently. Um, I'm also the co-chair of the foundation. So uh, I'll talk about the postmodern EHR concept, a little bit about health data, and just some basic stuff about open EHR. And I'll finish with use cases. A lot of them are going to be presented following uh, my talk, so I won't spend time on those. I'll just point out some of the ones that are not here. So when we look at healthcare, we try to think about the problems that we are trying to solve. And if we think about what would be ideal, we, come, we came up with these four four uh, things. So the first one, obviously, everybody's talking about patient-centric, but it's fair to say that we still build systems for hospitals, for institutions, not for patients. So that's definitely an area where we need uh, a lot of work, and OpenEHR is, is well-positioned to help here. The second one is that most issues in healthcare um, come because of lack of synchronization. That is, when patients pass through the levels of care, things fall through the cracks, errors happen, things get lost, and care um, is not optimal. The third one is that while we talk about data a lot, we see that a lot of decisions in healthcare, actually most of them, are still not made based on data. So this is definitely one of the things that needs, uh, needs our help. And then the last one is that it's not only that the data should be um, accessible, it's also the care, the guidelines, the knowledge should actually be accessible to everybody involved in the care of, uh, for a patient. So these are the four things which I believe we need to address with these new technologies. So the other side of the coin is that uh, Mike mentioned uh, a 90% adoption rate of EHRs. Of course, this has not come without problems. And articles uh, like, like this one, Why Doctors Hate Computers, or even worse, this one, death by a thousand clicks, prove that there needs to be a better way. We need to actually improve the way we're delivering IT solutions uh, to improve care. Uh, and it's, if you read these articles, uh, there is really a lot of work to do. So there's a number of things that are wrong with the current systems, and I'm sure all of you here uh, understand uh, most of them, so I won't go into, into detail here. But the basic problems are um, the ones that uh, inspired the articles uh, on, on the previous slides. And a lot of them has to do with data not flowing uh, as a liquid, as, as you mentioned, not being there when you need to make a decision. Now, I've used uh, an, an analogy for the last four or five years to try to explain how other industries have shown us the way. One of these industries is the ERP industry. And uh, you can think of them as the SAPs and the oracles uh, uh, of the world. But what Gartner said about four years ago is that the monolithic applications will not be uh, what we'll be using in the future because they do not meet the needs for that future. And that future is digital, agile, innovative. And these are the things that monolithic applications really, really struggle with even to the point where uh, Gartner says that they cannot cope with the agile needs of the digital economy. And I think it's no different in healthcare. The difference is that healthcare is a little bit less mature. Uh, it's about, I would say, five to seven years behind the advances in other areas like the ERP. So it's good to look at this industry to see where, where we are heading uh, in the healthcare space as well. Now, how we got here is also uh, 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 good to know because it's very similar. Actually, in healthcare, in a lot of places, we are still in this best of breed scenario. And this actually didn't work so well because the cost of integration, uh, the lack of uh, data flowing through these systems, and just the difficulty of putting this stuff together uh, basically uh, uh, prevented us from uh, getting the benefit out of all these applications. So because of the backlash of this, what happened was that we got the mega suite. And the mega suite, 
in the 90s was supposed to solve uh, all the issues with the best of breed. And it actually did uh, provide a pre-integrated uh, solution. The problem, of course, was that it was very hard to be the best solution for uh, each user group. And what started happening, for instance, in the CRM area is that despite having CRM in their suite, people went out and bought Salesforce to augment uh, the, um, the uh, ERP suite. And now we have many other examples. So what is actually happening is that the core is shrinking and we get innovation around that core. And this innovation comes in very different forms, but most of it is very different in terms of being cloud-based, upgraded overnight, easy to use, all of these things which the mega suite is usually not. So we believe the same thing is happening in the EHR space, but there is a fundamental difference between ERP and, and healthcare, and that is the data. So if you think about data in uh, telecoms or finance, uh, five-year-old data might not be that important. In healthcare, it's very important. In healthcare, we would like to have the data from cradle to grave for a very long time, which means that these integrations are uh, um, a big uh, challenge, which is why we believe that for this concept to work, these applications, the innovative applications, should be based on the same data models. And this is what we're trying to do with OpenEHR. So mode one, mode two, uh, again, uh, Gartner's idea of having um, the core, which is mode one, a reliable system which runs the business, and then having another way of developing applications, agile, uh, very different, even different teams, to actually take advantage of the innovation that is available. And the good thing is that uh, last year, uh, Gartner saw a shift towards funding this innovation, because we, we were talking about this for a very long time, but there was no funding for the innovation. And it's still like that today. If you think about putting in a mega suite, uh, it will be very hard to find additional funding for the innovation. So this is something that we need to keep in mind. Now let's come to, to healthcare. And today we already have a best of breed. Even if we have a mega suite, we have hundreds of other applications, not only the ones that are at the core, but also around that core. Now, with uh, the introduction of GDPR, what happened was people had to start counting these applications, and the results are staggering. So there's customers that have thousands of applications around that core, a lot of them disconnected. And of course, GDPR creates issues because they have to know where the patient data is, and they have to be able to delete the patient's data from all the systems if the patient so wishes. So this is becoming a real problem. And what I'm trying to uh, explain is that even if we replace this with a mega suite, a lot of those systems don't go away. And this has been seen in, in many, many instances. So we need to find a better way of solving, solving this issue. The way we propose is that instead of building the next innovative application among those up there, we should actually base the new applications, the new apps, on a common data platform. This will create uh, a lot of opportunity, but it will also solve the problem of data being disconnected, data being managed improperly. Because these small applications usually don't comply with GDPR. It's really hard for small companies or students or departments to build applications which would manage health data properly. So putting this onto a platform and actually making it possible for the next applications to automatically reuse the data that was collected makes a lot of sense. And in the end, through time, we can get into this basically bimodal world where we have a core, but then we also have an ecosystem or an app store with apps which do not keep their own data, do not store their own data in their own formats, but actually release data to a common data uh, model and data store. So this is what we call the postmodern EHR. And if done correctly, we can see how this would work uh, in a community or uh, city, region, country-wide uh, initiative. So without replacing the existing systems, which is really hard to do in the short term, we can add the functionality 
uh, move some of the data out into an open data platform. But once we have done this in a number of uh, hospitals, institutions, um, patient-generated data, and so on, we actually have a virtual care record which can be queried across, not just through APIs, which release or, or give access to some of the data, but actually full access to all the data that has been persisted in an open format. And uh, I know the Aperta Foundation has published uh, a paper called uh, uh, Co-Design PHR, Co-PHR, which talks a lot about how this can be done. And I think this is something that uh, has uh, um, a lot of potential. Uh, it actually does require the vendors to release the data. And then getting to the data is basically just a legal issue, not a, uh, an exercise in integration and a lot of, uh, a lot of um, time and effort spent doing that. So with this approach, we can actually move to uh, innovation, to uh, engaging smaller companies to, to help us provide the IT that we need without breaking with the past, which is, which is very hard to do. And we can actually um, uh, enable this uh, agility and flexibility while keeping uh, the lights on for uh, the, the, the core systems. Now, the health data part, of course, is, is the key. And the reason is that today, applications keep data in different formats, even the same data. So. Um, some examples of how medication data is stored um, in different types of apps. Sometimes there's a reason, but a lot of times it's just inertia. People develop applications and they start by modeling data. So this is definitely something that needs to change. And again, like I said before, it's not specific to healthcare. This is done in all industries. The problem in healthcare is that we would like to keep data for a very long time, as I said, and that means that we will be converting data from one proprietary format to another every time we switch applications. And if we do this every five, uh, sorry, every 10, 15 years, that means seven to eight times during the lifetime of this data, moving from one proprietary format to another. Now, the good news is we've already done this uh, in healthcare for imaging data 25 years ago. Uh, the DICOM format is a common format which everybody can use. Uh, PDF uh, is a vendor-neutral format which we can use for documents, or even HL7 CDA. Now, the data that we're most interested in uh, is the structured data, the data that can be used for decision support uh, and AI. And of course, unfortunately, this data is almost always kept in the silos of the applications that produce them. So this is what OpenEHR tries to do. Move that data out, just like PAX has moved the image format or removed the image format from the modality, from the device or the application, to do the same thing for structured, structured health data. And when we do this, we get an architecture which at the bottom level, separates the three types of data from an access mechanism, service bus, uh, and then from the applications. And the good thing here is that these applications do not have to come from the same vendor. They can come from very different vendors, and you'll see the examples of this today. Uh, and ideally, you're able to switch components without uh, having to uh, do the integration again. Now, Gartner recognized uh, this, uh, the importance of this idea in a statement uh, about two years ago in a research paper saying that to be truly open, you actually need to persist data in an open format. So exchanging data, which is what the industry is mostly proposing, will only take you so far. Now, imagine you need to keep this data for 60, 70 years. In this time, just the last 20 years, we have gone through four versions of access mechanisms, HL7, 1, 2, 3, and basically FHIR, which is version 4. 
Of course, we need all these uh, access through APIs for the old existing systems. But when we're building new systems, why not just store it in an open manner? What is the reason? And you will find that it's mostly business reasons. It's not technical. So these business reasons clash with what the customers want, the customers being the institutions or the patients. And I think it's actually time to recognize this and to actually uh, insist that vendors store data in an open format. Because this is the only way that the customer or the patient will be able to access all the data, not just the data that the vendor intended them to, to use. So this brings us to OpenEHR, which is what format uh, is this data? And Ian has, has talked a little bit about uh, the background uh, and about the fact that this is actually a set of specifications which are free to use. Uh, it has certain uh, characteristics which make it really, really useful for managing health data. One of them is this clear separation of the clinical side, the modeling, and the technical side, the building of applications and software. Now, why is this important? Because you don't think about it, but actually, today, we either have IT people building clinical models or we have doctors coding. Now, both of these are not good, right? I mean, there's some exceptions, Ian, I, I know. <laughs> But think about that, right? What OpenEHR enables us to do is to separate these, have clinical people build the models, and IT people build the software. So where does uh, the data uh, appear? Where is it generated? There's four basic steps to any clinical process at the highest level. The first one is the observations, so anything we observe about the patient. That's the largest set of clinical models. The second one is the evaluation phase, where somebody, based on this data and knowledge, makes a decision, or an assessment, or a diagnosis. And then the third one is when they issue instructions for further tests, for procedures, for giving medications. And then the last one is when this is actually carried out, the action. So performing a surgery, uh, doing a lab test, uh, giving medication to a patient. So these are the four types of models, and the models are called archetypes. So archetypes are what we call a maximal data set, a universal model which can be used for this medical term, this, uh, uh, the medical term, uh, in, for instance, blood pressure, anywhere in the world in any use case. So what you will notice is that it's not just systolic, diastolic, not just the data itself, but also the context of the measurement. And this is really important, because if we want to interpret the data correctly, we need to know whether the patient was on a bike or not, whether he was under exertion, because this affects the data that we have collected, systolic, diastolic. Sleep status, tilt, device, uh, cuff size, all of this could be very important when interpreting this data. And mind you, we're talking about data that can be used years later. So storing the context is key. We also tie these uh, uh, attributes to terminologies. Some of them have uh, international terminologies, ICD, LOINC, and so on. Some of them have local terminologies. And we also translate the archetype right here into different languages. But this is a universal uh, data set. And of course, we need more archetypes to make any useful form, uh, report, uh, or screen. So we collect them into something called templates. Now, the important thing is that the template is always use case specific. So while the archetype is universal, the template for a GP visit and a cardiologist encounter will be different. The, the cardiologist will obviously want more detail from the blood pressure and, uh, and some other archetypes than the GP visit. This is really important because with this, we come much closer to what actually the programmers need to make the application. And again, this is done before writing a single line of code. So this is done by the modelers, uh, the people who actually understand the data much better than the IT people. So, in the uh, regional or national context, uh, 
Ian mentioned the CKM, the Clinical Knowledge Manager. This is basically how the whole infrastructure, the knowledge production environment, as we call it, works. We have terminologies and archetypes. At some level of the region, we generate some templates. If you think about a discharge summary, you would want the whole region to have the same discharge summary. But from then on, we leave it to vendors, uh, integrators, developers, to actually solve the use cases using whatever technology they want. We don't prescribe technology. We don't prescribe uh, servers. As long as they comply to the specifications, any application that is built using the same terminologies and uh, archetypes, the data produced by that application will be able to be queried just by knowing these two. So nothing about technology or the application that, uh, that was built. And this is really important because we cannot control that. Uh, this is what national programs have been trying to do for, for a long time. If they had focused on terminology and, and archetypes, the core data, data elements, uh, and let the technology and the applications uh, be chosen by the market, I think a lot of initiatives, including the, the UK uh, uh, initiative of 10 years ago, would have been successful. Because it's quite logical that different institutions need different applications, but they should not have different data because it's based on the patient. Uh, 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 on, the, on the patient. So if we look at how applications are built, we can see that uh, applications today are a mix of different types of code, whereas we really want to layer them out. And if we look at applications in this way, OpenEHR solves the data layer, as we call it. Now, uh, Mike mentioned that uh, there is another layer that we are working on now. It's called task planning. Uh, and it's just about to go into production uh, at one of our sites. So hopefully in the next uh, few months, we'll be talking more about this. But it's trying to solve the clinical workflow area, uh, which we believe also should be vendor neutral. Why? Because a patient goes through many different uh, uh, care settings, which means that the guidelines should be external to those care settings and to the applications that are in those care settings. Okay, I won't go into, into detail, I'll just finish with, um, uh, with some use cases, some of the ones that will not be presented today. So we have um, adoption of OpenEHR in a lot of areas, uh, even in, uh, in uh, Canada now, starting uh, with the notable exception of the US, and we can talk about this over, over lunch, uh, why that's the case. Uh, we have some huge adoption in China. Uh, uh, Ian mentioned uh, the, the Chinese army. This is really massive with uh, 200 hospitals, 1,400 clinics. Um, but we also have some, uh, some uh, really interesting uh, applications. Again, a lot of them you will see. Uh, that's why I'll touch only on the ones that, uh, that won't be presented. We are grouping them into four different, five different categories. So obviously you can build the whole EHR uh, based on this uh, approach. You can also do a shared care record, which means that the data has been collected somewhere else, normalizing it, transforming it, putting it in, into a, a shared care record. Then research is a big area because, of course, research institutions want to share data and they want to uh, do that in the same format. Registries are basically a data normalization effort. And then the last one is, once you have collected all this data, you have the APIs, why not open up these APIs for innovators to take advantage of this and build innovative apps? So I will go quickly through these. Moscow is interesting because it was one of the first, and it's also one of the biggest. Uh, it's 12 million patients, about 1,000 institutions, all running off one data infra infrastructure. Uh, they did some really interesting things uh, in terms of vis visualizing what's going on in healthcare uh, and have in the process transformed the city's uh, systems. Uh, this happened three, four years ago. They are now uh, the next customer for, uh, for task planning, running clinical guidelines across the city for 12 million patients. 
which hopefully we can present uh, next year. Uh, the uh, uh, University Medical Center of Ljubljana is really important because it's a stage six, MRAM stage six hospital, with which we have proven that we can actually cover the needs of HIMSS MRAM stage six using a fully open EHR based solution. Um, open EP, which is uh, available in, in this market as well, uh, was actually the first application which used the CareConnect profiles to connect uh, uh, to uh, the uh, e-prescribing to pharmacy from another vendor. Uh, there's examples. Uh, I have two more minutes. This one is interesting, uh, and you will see that a lot of these examples are from the Nordics. Uh, why is that? Because I feel the Nordics have been doing this for a very long time. They've been collecting quality data for 20 years. Of course, most of it was collected in a proprietary fashion, meaning that there, it was normalized to a format. But now a lot of them have realized that maybe this is a waste of resource. Maybe if they agreed to collect the data in the original format, this would make much more sense. So UNA is one, uh, Finland, this is the centralized Finnish system which is moving their proprietary data modeling to OpenEHR. Uh, you will hear uh, later from Celia from Norway where this is done at scale with four out of the th uh, three out of the four regions. Uh, you will hear from uh, uh, Patient Xi, the primary care vendor. Anyway, the Nordics seem to be uh, uh, furthest ahead. There's uh, initiatives in Leeds, in Sweden, uh, Sardinia with, uh, with Impeco, the, uh, about one million uh, uh, inhabitants of Sardinia are getting a healthcare record based on uh, open EHR. Uh, Norway, I mentioned, uh, there it's actually become uh, the national uh, level which does the modeling, which is really interesting. The vendors actually initiated this, but then the national level, which has been trying to standardize this for 15 years, actually got with it and is providing the modeling services to the vendors to build applications. Genomics England was mentioned briefly. This is one of the larger projects here with about uh, 27 hospitals now normalizing data into OpenEHR so they can share it with Genomics England. Uh, Germany, uh, eight university hospitals normalizing the data for research uh, using Open EHR to persist, fire to exchange, SNOMED for terminologies. And we see this, this combination quite a lot. And then the last one, uh, once this data is collected, getting the innovation into the trusts at Salford, uh, at Plymouth, and we'll be hearing from Taunton later on. I won't have time for the video, but just to summarize. So, I tried to show you how we believe that healthcare is changing uh, and that today's applications really can't cope with this change. The ERP, another industry, went from best of breed to mega suite to postmodern, and we believe the same will happen in healthcare. And it's a practical approach without replacing what you have in the short term. The life cycle of applications and data is very different, so we think that they should be separated. And the future is definitely multi-vendor. There is no vendor that has a monopoly on innovation. And we believe that the data should not be hijacked by any one of them. And I hope you've seen and throughout the day you will see how OpenEHR provides a proven platform to build new applications. Thank you. <laughs>